The Realm Tree. Episode 13, What Are You Made Of? Let us begin this meeting of the Grand Fairy Council. We've wasted enough time. <laughs> so impatient, General Avalon. Must you do this every meeting? One of these days, you really ought to loosen up and bring cookies for us. The day I bring cookies. This is the day you burn down your own estate, Representative Von Brass. Now hold on just a moment, everyone. Doesn't it seem in bad form to stop without Ignatius? Uh, I do hope he's all right. You know, his blood pressure isn't doing so well these days. If he is late, that is his own fault. I agree with Moth. We should not start without Representative Doherty. If he is still monitoring the tree, he may have news for us. Wick. You are the softest sovereign I have ever seen. And you need to learn emotional range beyond anger, General Avalon. But I actually do agree with you today. We can't always wait on our winter representative's old bones. Now, Beatrice, darling, you are almost as old as Ignatius. Don't be rude. I am getting up there in years. And yet, here I am. On time for this council meeting, as I have always been for the past several decades since I took over this seat, far longer than any of you have. Little Sovereign Cassius is truly an infant compared to my many years. Everyone, urgent updates from the surveillance within the realm tree. There's our geezer. Forgive me, I don't do much running anymore, and corridors in this part of the tree are, well, too small to fly in. Regardless, the test is in a state of chaos. We must end it right away. It's not like you to break tradition, Ignatius. This test has been a key foundation for training the realm's future leaders for the past several centuries. There are more important things than that right now. Lives are at stake. Well, there are always lives at stake, Ignatius. The test isn't meant to be a walk in the park. All the fairies that elect to take it know exactly what they're getting into. Something is different this year. There is a coalition of fairies in there that are kidnapping or perhaps even killing their fellow test takers. Oh, man. This is quite a serious thing to bring to our attention, Ignatius. What illicit activity do you claim to have seen through your surveillance veins? Well, that's the issue. The things I haven't seen. Now, my surveillance veins can't see everything at once, and they have no auditory component, but I can move them around as needed to cover more ground, and some of the young fairies just disappear. I've lost over a dozen of them this way. They escape my vision. I attempt to follow them and then they're gone. Are you certain this isn't due to negligence on your own part? I have decent surveillance abilities and can take charge instead. No, no, certainly not. I may be old, but I run my surveillance like clockwork and have so for decades, even before joining the council. This isn't a natural occurrence. Especially since the fairies across the tree who vanish all disappear in the same sort of place. The type of land I cannot survey properly. In the loose soil, correct? That's right. The common piece of land where I cannot place my veins. And the lost fairies vanished most commonly around areas dominant with soil. The toxic swamp, the hanging forest, and the verdant field. Now, can anyone tell me what this means? This isn't one of your classes, Doherty. Just speak to us. Apologies, force of habit. Well, it means that our perpetrators kidnapping other fairies must have some awareness of the blind spots in my power. So their nefarious deeds can be done out of our sight. That's why I believe fairies are the culprits and not the giant beasts in the tree. You're telling me this is all theoretical then? Based on your own conjecture? Still, what you're saying is very concerning, especially to me. I have a granddaughter in the test this year. If this endangers my little sunshine, perhaps we should postpone the trial. Stopping the test would be an unprecedented action. Intervening to make fights safer, I have agreed to. But stopping the whole thing is madness. Yes, but it's our fail-safe. And killing other fairies warrants punishment and disqualification. Lives take priority, Kent. That is what I tell the young ones before the test, what I always try to enforce, and the morally correct choice. 
So please, let's have a vote on getting the children out of there. There will be no vote. I invoke my power as sovereign to make this decision. You can't make a call on this without a vote. No, he's correct. He has the rat. If there is a failing in the test, I will take accountability for it. One of your many failures, eh, Cass? Beatrice, this isn't the time. I believe that putting the fairies into teams this year would keep things safer. But I was wrong. I will accept whatever punishment the council deems necessary. I know the general has had an eye on your seat for quite some time. Not the time, Beatrice. However, the test within the realm tree will resume as intended. We will not interfere. Excuse me? We won't do anything about this? The purpose of the test is to decide who is most worthy of receiving their wings. The difficulty may have changed, but the goal has not. We will find the most suitable fairies to receive their wings. Cassius, isn't your own child taking the test this year? And you had a hand in picking the teams, partnering her with strong and trustworthy allies. It seems like you care quite a bit for her safety. I'm making this decision independent of my feelings. Please. You haven't felt a single emotion in your life, Cassius. I never thought I'd see the day, but I'm taking Wick's side. No one coddled us during our test, and we earned our wings. They should not receive special treatment. This isn't about earning anything. This is about safety. How can you say this when lives are at stake? My decision is final, Representative Doherty. We will not intervene in the test. After saving Mercury and escaping the tunnels, Daisy patched up our injuries, including my leg, to the best of her ability. Hey. Thanks, Daisy. We'd probably be dead without you patching us up all the time. Helping is its own reward. That's what my folks always said. Should we be concerned about the five or so murderous jewel-harvesting fairies that we barely escaped from? Aquamarine flooding the tunnels should have slowed them down at least a little bit. Let's just find the way to the next area of the tree. Alright, I know this is unexpected coming from me, but I think I found the way forward when scouting the field before. Yeah, Rondell! There's a tunnel in one of these hills that leads to more tunnels. Not like the web ones where we fought Jonathan. Dirt tunnels. Like an anthill. Interesting. Yeah! But those tunnels don't just go down. One of them goes up, through the trunk. And I think that's the way forward. Follow me! My beast clung happily to my back as Rondell led us up. I'd slip her a ration every few minutes. After a dive together into the soil and one grueling vertical climb out of it, we emerged into a new open area of rocks and water. A massive expanse of smooth stone shaped by runoff, painted by waterfalls and streams. Yo, this place is crazy! Doesn't even look like a tree in here. <sighs> Rivers, stone formations, it's like a beautiful valley. So many cool rocks. I love cool rocks! No way, me too! It's getting colder too. If that means we're already past the warm parts of the tree and the rest is this, color me disappointed. Not necessarily true. Many of the test environments seem artificial. Between the stones and rivers, this valley was likely made by a Terramancer fairy and someone like Aquamarine working together. Or perhaps multiples of each. Also, take a look up there. Mercury indicated a ball of light high above us. How'd the sun get in here? It's not the sun. That's Luxomancy. Some light manipulating fairy put a small artificial sun in this part of the tree. It all looks so real and natural. But it's made and maintained by magic? <laughs> That's incredible. Yo, there's fish in the water! Hell yeah! I'm starving. I don't eat meat or fish, so I'll make do with rations. But I'll, uh, happily grill some for the team. As our resident fisher person, Talia, would you like to do the honors? <laughs> sure. Give me a bit and I'll grab dinner for all of us. The artificial sun above us started to dim as I speared a number of decently sized fish for us to eat. By the time it was replicating sundown, Rondell finished terraforming the rocks into a comfortable and inconspicuous shelter behind a waterfall. Rondell, didn't we just infiltrate a hideout behind a waterfall? It's so obvious, they won't expect it. Rehearsed psychology. You're thinking of reverse psychology, but it's still wrong. As long as it's safe enough to eat and sleep, I'm happy. Let's still keep watch tonight. We can't take risks now that we know fairies are after our lives. 
After spitting a fishbone into the waterfall next to her, Daisy clapped her hands together and looked around at all of us. Alrighty, friends. So, this seems like a good time for a little group check-in. A lot has happened over the past few days. We almost died! Crazy! So, I thought it would be nice if we took a sec to make sure we're all on the same page about the people trying to kill us. Sound good? Excellent yeah, idea. I'm in. Learning! Nadine, sweetie, I feel like you're the type of person to have parchment and a writing implement on you at all times. Wow, assumptions. But you're right. Feel like drawing some faces for us, Lex? With pleasure. Light, please, Mercury. Mercury's hands lit up the cave with a dim glow as Lex began to sketch. So we have a group of nasty jewel hunters running around during the test. They rip out your jewel, you die, then they sew your jewel into themselves. I shifted my position but didn't say anything. It couldn't be shadow stitching, right? Despite that, we haven't encountered anyone with more than two jewels. They had a collection of about a dozen I found in a hidden chest. It's possible that using more than two jewels runs the risk of overloading your own body with magic. Then why do they keep more just locked up? Maybe to sell on some sort of black market? A lot of fairies would shell out money for additional power. Gangsters, revolutionaries, the military. Uh, don't you want to be a big military guy? Yes, and I know not to trust them. Seems a bit hypocritical, don't you think? Show me a better way to make money in the day realm without an education, and I'll do that instead. Though I feel like jobs aren't your area of expertise. Boo! Stop that! We were getting along so well tonight! I'm sorry. That was uncalled for. I, it's fine, mate. I don't know anything about jobs. Art? Beauty? More my scene. I wouldn't call jobs a scene. Anyway, whatever the reason is, they're real scary. And dangerous. Jonathan Hale came pretty close to killing at least one of us. I vaguely knew him from the Winter Realm. He was a classmate of mine under Professor Doherty. But like a mountain. Seriously. That kid's a stone wall on top of that cold ore of death. He took a kick to the head plus a super-powered harpoon throw and stood back up. He didn't even flinch until Mercury blinded him. He'll shake that off. And he probably shook off being drowned in those tunnels, too. Speaking of drowning, our old friend Aquamarine's coming for Talia. She was always a bully, but looks like she shifted to murderous. And I dealt with another Spring Realm fairy on my own. Callum Thorne. The one who captured me. He's the smiling mop-haired boy from the tournament, much smaller than Jonathan. His power involves some control of plant life, focusing largely on pollens and toxins that act when inhaled. Effects I've seen so far have been knocking someone unconscious and affecting their perception of reality. But he was also responsible for the glowing mushrooms that lit up their secret tunnel, so his powers may extend beyond that. I actually did know him from back home. He was really interested in volunteering for my folks and other doctors. But now it looks like he's using the medical knowledge he picked up to make some scary narcotics. Lex proudly turned the parchment he was given around to show off his sketch. The facial features and hair were quite detailed, though he did draw an exaggerated Jonathan three times larger than Callum and with a tiny head. Ultimately, Callum wasn't the ringleader of the operation. That was the red-eyed Dayrealm fairy he called Era. Era Stratus is her full name, if my memory is correct, from the tournament. Like Callum and Jonathan, she focused on brawling and martial arts instead of powers to win her match. Almost definitely to hide her abilities. But she displayed gravity manipulation during my brief encounter with her. My body became so heavy that moving was almost impossible. I've never seen or heard anything about her during my 16 years in the Day Realm, which is strange because our strongest fighters come from the military. There's also our snowman friend Malthus who ran off before we got out, and big guy Ernest who booked it at the first sign of danger. If his ability is just finding heat signatures like Malthus said, then he's more of a reconnaissance fairy than a combat one. You know, he's probably such a muscle head to compensate for his weak sauce powers. Is that why you began working out? I don't get what you're saying. So, that's the murder crew we're up against. We all saw them in the tournament, but now we know what they can do. Era, Callum, Jonathan, Aquamarine, Ernest, and probably Malthus. Plus Team Sunshine, but as far as we know, they're not trying to kill us. Lex turned around his drawing, revealing a collage of pencil-sketched fairies in Mercury's light. At the center was Era, gazing stoically forward, face framed by her black hair. I did not sleep peacefully that night. I saw myself drowning in Aquamarine's whirlpool before getting lifted out by a giant owl. It dropped me in the air before sweeping me back up. I was fresh prey, dangling helpless in its grasp. I wasn't strong enough to escape. The giant snowflakes grabbed both me and the owl, crushing it. I slipped out the bottom and fell. Then I was fighting Jonathan Hale again. 
He knocked away all of my attacks, whether they were stabs, punches, or kicks. I slipped on the frozen ground beneath my feet, falling on my back. The whole world was ice, terrifying icicle spires as far as the eye could see. Your time in this world has come to an end. No tricks can stop a spear to the heart. He slowly pulled the pole off his back before turning the tip into a glacial spearhead. Without any emotion in his eye, he drove it into my chest. The ice cracked below me. I fell into the water and everything went dark. And then... A blue glow. Mud between my toes. The sound of rain. In front of me, a mysterious figure. A shadow given form. A smile on her face. I hadn't seen her before. At least not like this. But I knew who she was. You're the beast. My beast. Maybe. And what are you? Me? I'm Talia. Well, that's your name. But what are you? What are you made of? I could ask the same of you. I have no idea who you are. Well, as you can see, I'm not a cat. And I'm definitely not a squirrel. So stop calling me that. What do I call you then? Jinx. That's my name. If it bothers you so much, why didn't you tell me before? You never bothered to ask. Rude, honestly. All right then, Jinx? That's your name. But what are you? Why can you fuse with me? Why did you give me these powers? Am, am I special? Oh, you're just borrowing them. And I like you, Talia. There's something in you. What do you mean? Something... dark. Like a deep whirlpool. And yet... Yes? You're not special, Talia. You're just you. Wow. Thanks. But the things you do are what can make you special. They can become you. Now wake up, Talia. Talia, wake up. My eyes opened. I was curled up in the alcove with most of my team asleep around me. Except for Mercury shaking me awake and Nadine sitting quietly looking out over the waterfall. <sighs> Mercury, I was dreaming. I already did my watch for tonight. I know. It's... Me and Nadine's turn. But she'll hold it down by herself while we go and train. Thank me later. Train? Let's go. Bring your cat. My Jinx. Wait, wait, I mean her name is Jinx. Sure. Come on. Under the light of the artificial moon, Mercury took me past the waterfall, across the rocks into a large pond in a stone basin. It had three large circular islands floating in the center, made out of the same stone. <sighs> This should wake you up. Huh? Ah! With one hand, he casually pushed me into the water. I splashed back to the surface, seeing Jinx had left onto Mercury to avoid taking a dip. <sighs> oh my gosh. Okay. Why? You and I are going to train in hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you injured your leg kicking Jonathan Hale with the force of your new powers, you could do it again unless you learn proper form. And if it's a permanent injury, Daisy can only do so much. Now dry off and get Jinx to fuse with you. As I pulled myself out of the water, Jinx climbed from Mercury's shoulder back onto mine. She sunk into my back, once again yielding a row of small jewels down my spine. Mercury and I placed ourselves across from one another on a rock island in the stone basin. Show me how you kicked Jonathan. I whirled my leg around in a full roundhouse. Hmm. Not bad. Now show me how you punch. I pulled my fist back and then swung it forward, losing my footing on the follow-through. That definitely needs work. Alright. Where do I start? We don't have much time, so we'll focus on the basics and a simple combat philosophy. Aim for the soft parts of their body with the bony parts of yours. Maximize damage to them while minimizing damage to yourself. Makes sense. Think about how Daisy knocked out Ernest in the tournament. He was bigger than her, so she aimed a strong punch to his stomach area. It's a wide target and a dangerous place to get hit by blunt force. Daisy will be a good model for you to follow. She has super strength, but not super durability. So she has, perhaps unconsciously, adjusted her fighting style to hit weak points with strong blows. And she is incredibly adept at maneuvers like throwing and grappling. I've seen how strong Daisy can get. I'm not anywhere near that level. No, but you're faster. Especially with your new abilities. I'm confident you can learn to be more precise and hit the right areas with your strikes. You can be just as formidable as her, and perhaps as fast as me. 
you may still fight primarily with your harpoon, but if you can apply this magical strength to your physical blows safely, you'll become even more versatile. <laughs> Easy enough. Show me how to hit people. Hmm. For the next hour, Mercury closely observed my fighting stances and strikes, correcting them as needed. He demonstrated the most effective ways to punch, kick, and headbutt, using all of my limbs as weapons even when I hold my harpoon. Your fundamentals are strong, they just need refinement. Let's move on to using Jinx's powers. Your new abilities are tied to your emotions, correct? I think so. That's pretty typical of jewel powers, right? Yes. Most beginners start from a place of emotion. Some become stronger by tapping into those emotions and embellishing them, but others deviate and learn to tap into those powers from a place of calm and control. I'm in the latter group, but we don't have time to teach you this quickly. Now, we're going to spar, and you'll try to knock me off this platform into the water. Okay, now you really have my attention. Revenge for me pushing you in earlier? <laughs> Perhaps. We returned to opposite sides of the Stone Island. Mercury took a low stance. I'm going to come at you, fast. Ready? Ready. Talia, dodge left. He was in front of me in an instant. My heart started with a jolt and I instinctively dodged his palm trying to shove me into the water. Using the momentum, I spun around and tried to sweep under his legs with my own to trip him, but he dashed back to the other end of the island in a flash before I was even done spinning my leg around. Okay, you are way faster than me. Huh. I get that a lot. He dashed at me again, but this time I was ready. I knocked his arm aside with my own and aimed to shove at his chest. He wasn't much taller than me, so it was hard to aim lower. I made contact, slamming him, but didn't push him further than a few steps back. If you had used Jinx's powers in that strike, you could have knocked me off the island. I can see you're learning, but don't forget next time. That's good. Now, come at me. I entered a running stance and charged up Jinx's dark energy. I shot forward in a burst of speed, and then I was tumbling. Mercury had stepped out of the way and just tripped me. I hit the water again with a splash. Ugh. That went a lot worse than I was expecting. Your final lesson of the night is that on top of knowing what you can do, you need to know what your opponent can do. The best fighters keep track of both. Here. Mercury pulled me out of the water, Jinx emerging from my back and taking her favorite spot on my shoulder. But this is a good start. You're a fast learner. You're a much nicer teacher than I thought you'd be. Other than knocking me in the water and such. <laughs> well, you know that I trained in the military academy. I've experienced what it's like to learn from people always trying to degrade you. It might be effective for some, but frankly, I can't bring myself to do it. I believe you learn the most when people are honest and fair about your progress. It keeps you interested in learning. And tonight was a good start. He firmly placed his palm on my shoulder and looked me in the eye. Talia? I will reach the top of this tree before this month ends, and I will get my wings. Now do me a favor and try to keep up. For the first time, I saw Mercury smile. A soft, encouraging smile just for this moment, and just between us. Same goes for you. Better not lose you on my way to the top. The Realm Tree was created by Jumar Thompson and Julian Hermano, and is performed by voice artists all over the world. To show your support, please visit therealmtree.com and follow our socials. Thank you for listening, and tune in next time for Episode 14, A Time Long Gone.